All right, so um, welcome to Griffin, guys. Uh, my name is Blake. I'm a software developer here. I've been coming to Cocoa Heads, Tail and Bridge. This is my, my one-year anniversary. Um, so thanks for coming tonight. And so we're going to talk about how to use um, Apple's new Swift programming language as a scripting language. I don't know if any of you guys have experience doing Bash scripting or Apple scripting, uh, or if you've had a chance to delve into the new uh, using JavaScript for automation. Um, well, turns out you can actually use Swift to do automation as well, um, and just to make some simple command line uh, scripts to do whatever you need it to do. <clears throat> uh, just a couple of prerequisites before we get started. Um, the things I'm going to talk about tonight, um, at least the specifics of how I'm doing them, are assuming that you're running the latest version of Yosemite and the newest version of Xcode 6. Um, you can accomplish a lot of this stuff on uh, Mavericks and older versions of Xcode 6, uh, but you may have to set up like some bash aliases to simplify the commands down, um, or else you'll have to call the full path to like the Swift compiler, uh, which is a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, before we go into the specifics of how you build a Swift script, uh, I'm just going to talk about the background a little bit. Um, has anybody have an opportunity to play with the REPL yet? So with Swift, Apple has bundled the read, evaluate, print loop, which is this really cool interactive command line environment um, where you can just type out simple expressions and functions, um, and it'll give you immediate feedback on whether it's good, bad, um, and also how it evaluates. Um, just to give you a quick introduction here, if you just type Swift and hit enter, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the REPL. Uh, you can see it prompts you with a little help if you need some help. Um, but otherwise, you can just start printing Swift, uh, typing Swift code. Let's do the simple hello world. Oops. And it'll give you immediate feedback. <clears throat> so, this is important because um, when we launch the REPL, we're actually launching an interactive Swift environment. And when we do the Swift scripting, we're actually going to um, invoke the Swift environment along the way. Um, so the next thing here, in the right directory, oops, yeah. So after the Swift REPL, then you can do um, what's called Swift immediate mode. So what you can do is you can type Swift and you can pass it in a file, any file, any Swift file that is you know properly formatted. Um, and it'll immediately give you feedback. So you're basically just passing it into the Swift environment and saying, hey, run this file. And this is not quite the same thing as Swift uh, scripting, but we're going to use this principle here in just a few minutes. So we could, uh, I think I have a file here, and it's just a simple hello world example, nothing special. Um, I do some definitions here, and I think we have, what, like 10 people here today. So we'll just save that. I'll go ahead and run it, and we get immediate feedback. So, again, this is the Swift immediate mode. Um, we could also manually compile Swift files. Um, Swift actually comes with a uh, Swift compiler, so we can run Swift C rather than Swift, and we can compile a binary. So, if we go over here to this folder, um, yes. And you can see right here that we have a new binary file. Um, you can compile multiple files together if you wanted to manually compile a small project. Instead of using Xcode, um, you can use the full Cocoa Foundation, all the APIs. Um, just one important note if you're trying to compile multiple files together, you have to have an insertion point, which is a main.swift file. So it kind of does. Um, Harken back to older procedural programming and some of the under the hood stuff that Xcode does for free for you. All right, um, so I was just going to give you—I was just giving you guys a little bit of a background, um, just so you can have a little bit of knowledge, so you can experiment with it on your own. But you can access not only just the Swift environment, but also the Swift compiler to compile binaries, uh, which are nice if you're, you know, building a, like a command line application that you want to ship but not give your source code away or something like that. Um, <clears throat> which brings us to Swift scripts. So they behave kind of like an interpreted script, um, but it is not quite the same thing. So under the hood, 
um, we were actually passing our file to the Swift environment, and it compiles a binary and then runs it. Um, so it's not a true interpreted script like some, something like Python or Ruby. <clears throat> um, so there's a little bit of magic involved uh, with making a script work, and it all revolves around this line right here, and that is what's known as a shebang or a hash bang, or there's a couple of other terminology out there for it. So basically what this line does is as soon as we start running our file, we try to execute our file, it starts at the top of our file and it sees that hash bang and says, oh wait, we actually don't want to run this file. What we want to do is we want to go into the user bin folder and launch the Swift environment and then pass this file to it to run and execute. Um, so it's a little bit of um, redirection. Um, but that, that's essentially what happens when we when we launch a Swift script is it sees that shebang, launches the Swift environment, and then passes the rest of our file into it for execution. Um, the next part is we have to make the file executable. So what we do uh, is we just change file permissions. So we do a chmod, uh, and then we add a plus x to make it executable. And then this file that we're running here is file two. So I'll just do this, and that makes it executable. Now, just to come back and look here, the next thing we have to do when we're trying to use a file is we do have to process if you have any kind of user input. This is totally optional. Um, so if you have a script that only does basic file management and you don't want to have any user input, you don't have to add any. Um, but the key here is you use the process.arguments, and it gives you an array of strings. Now this is a space delimited array of strings. So if you type in one, two, three, four after your command, um, each of those will be its own string. Um, so it's just an array. I assume, <coughs> I assume argument zero is a script name? Yes, yes. Um, actually, and we're going to cover that in the next one. Okay. So you can see there, it is a zero based array and I start here with one and two. Um, so we're skipping argument zero for this example. So um, the shell breaking that up? Yeah, yeah. If, if you do have a double quote enclosed argument, it's, it's treated as one, yes. So we'll go ahead and run this one, and we'll supply, I think it was, okay, and we'll actually escape this, and that'll also treat it as one if you escape it properly. We'll say 10 people. All right. And what was your name again? Oh, John. John, as John pointed out, um, if we just pass, if we look at argument zero, so uh, we'll go ahead and look at that, uh, and then we'll do one, two, three, and what this is going to do is it's going to grab our arguments right here, it's going to enumerate them, and then assign each one an index, and print each argument out on a line. So we'll go ahead and run that. And you can see, as John was saying, the first one is going to be a basically a call, not a call, but the, the path to your file um, that you called. And if we run that again, but we enclose the argument in double quotes, you can see that it only gives us two arguments. So it's either a properly double quote enclosed um, mm -hmm string of text or properly escaped. I will say um, it doesn't seem to like exp uh, explanation marks, exclamation marks. Um, I think it has something to do with some of the commands that the, the bash shell will interpret. Um, so even if you, you do have to properly escape them, but uh, it just seems to not like them very much. Is there reserved characters in bash? I, I think so, yeah. Um, so that, that's honestly, that's really all there is to get your script up and running. From this point on, if you handle user input correctly, um, you can basically do anything that you would do in a normal Cocoa application. You can access the full foundation, um, third-party APIs, um, talk about importing frameworks in just a minute. Um, so that's, that's really all there is to know just to get your first script up and running off the ground. Um, a couple of things afterwards, though, is, well, if you have an application, if you look at something like Git, you know that there are a lot of flags associated with it. So, you know, how would you build an, uh, an application that handles flags? 
Um, this is a quick and dirty method. Um, basically what you would do is you would define a set of flags um, and then you would just basically do a check against each argument that comes in. If you had a long and short flag, you might do something like or and then you would put your short flag there. Um, just to show you guys this, <coughs> and I went ahead and changed the permissions on all these <laughs> so I didn't have to do it over and over again. Uh, so that's why I'm not doing the ch mod for each file. So I defined a print flag. So it's just going to print all of our process arguments out. So what we'll do is we'll just put a couple in here. And it prints out the array. And also defined a help flag. Um, and it just gives a message back. And there are a lot of other ways that you could do this. You could use, you could define all of your options in an enum and use a switch statement to handle it. Um, I actually developed uh, a framework um, that you can define your, your long and short flags and you can also give it a completion handler. Um, and you just define it and then you call it and everything that you want is taken care of um, as the user does input. Um, do we have any questions so far? All right, just a couple of key points. Um, when you're developing scripts, um, a script is typically a single file application. Um, if you want to use multiple files uh, and spread your project out a little bit, you will have to compile a binary unless you're using a framework, in which case the framework will have to be a binary. Um, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, all code executes at the top level. so. Um, something like a print line statement or any of the stuff here that I have, it's going to execute because it's at the top level. But if you have like a function defined or a class defined, obviously you have to instantiate uh, a class or call a function to make it work. Um, another thing is it's all top-down compilation. So you can't use something before you have defined it. Um, it's pretty standard procedural stuff. Um, <clears throat> it can be pretty powerful. It's just sometimes if you're doing a complex script, it gets to be a pretty long file. Uh, if you're defining classes and stuff like that to do stuff. Um, <clears throat> if you want to play around with uh, building scripts, I found that uh, playgrounds are really handy to do prototyping because they basically follow the same rules. Um, you can define your own dummy process.arguments at the top. Um, not with process.arguments, but you, know, you can just call them process arguments or something. And then you can define an array of strings that you then pass to your program. Um, that's how I developed most of the scripts that I've been using, uh, just using a playground to do prototypes. Um, and you can basically copy and paste it from a playground into a script file. Just add the shebang at the top and correct the process arguments and you're basically up and running. Um, just a couple of key points, um, or tips rather. Um, so if we look at my bash profile. I set up a couple of aliases right here um, and these aliases are really nice because to call a Swift script all you have to do is call its file name um, but if you're not in the same directory you'd have to remember the file path to it and all that so if you set up an alias it lets you have basically universal access on your system uh, to that script so you can store it wherever you want. You can see I have mine stored in my Dropbox so that they're always backed up uh, but you can store them anywhere you wanted. You can store them in the bin file um, basically whatever your, your personal preference is. Um, these aliases, they just are uh, a convenience more than anything. Um, so um, the next tip is or importing third-party frameworks. <clears throat> um, this is, doesn't really have an example right now. I do have an application that uses a custom third-party framework, and I'll show you guys that uh, before we leave. Uh, but just a little bit of uh, explanation. Um, Third-party frameworks, um, now that you can use them on iOS and if you've had them for, if you've used them on the Mac before, um, you do have to make sure that the module settings are enabled on your third-party framework or they will not work with Swift um, because Swift does not actually use frameworks, they use modules. Um, and if you, you do enable those, those module settings, um, then when you compile your, your framework, um, it'll generate a, a Swift module file. That is what it looks for when it's calling in. 
Um, the key to that um, framework, you couldn't just use this file and import, I don't know, a framework called My Awesome Framework. Uh, there's a little bit of legwork. You have to store your framework file, um, preferably in the library frameworks directory. Um, and then you have to add a little bit more to this script right here. Uh, if you go under the Swift menu in the command line um, and do that Swift help, um, you'll see that it has quite a lot of options. And the one we're looking for specifically is this one right here. So we want to add a directory to a framework service path. This is one of the downsides of not using Xcode. Xcode does all this work for us. Um, when we're manually building scripts like this, uh, we do have to remember to do it. Um, and it does not, by default, just search the library frameworks path. At least not yet. They've made a lot of changes over the past year, um, six or eight months. Um, so hopefully they'll add that in for Swift to automatically check the public library folders. So then you would just specify your uh, directory. And now any framework you put in here that has modules enabled will be accessible within your uh, Swift file. So just a couple of other cool things uh, that you can do. Um, you can handle users dynamic input so if you want to have an, inter have an interactive uh, script uh, for whatever we have an example here it's essentially the last one that handles arguments but if we pass in a help argument it will then use the uh, ns file handle class and give us a standard input object uh, which will then prompt the user to um, allow the user to input more data so if we run this one clear this out so I'm going to go ahead and specify help. Um, and you ask, what would you like help with? Just go ahead and say life. And then you can handle that. So you can see that you could, if you wanted to, you could nest handling flags or arguments, or you could write you know, a command line application to walk a user through something like entering their username and password um, for some kind of tool that you've built. Um, could you show us the code for that? Yeah, yeah, code absolutely. Code? So the only thing different, so this is just the, the basic <clears throat> framework for it. The only thing different that I added um, is this line, these few lines of code right here. That's a standard Coco class in Foundation. You do have to, if you'll notice, you do have to import Foundation or it'll give you this fancy error message that's pretty disconcerting. So this is like what we were talking about before everyone got here. You could make the Foundation class calls the key chain. Well, this is not specifically it, but yeah, yeah. So if you, you do something like that. and that's that's another thing we were talking about. Um, I don't know if anybody saw. I think it was Daniel Jowkitz. Uh, he's got a tool out there that lets you basically make secure calls into the keychain to pull usernames and passwords, um, so that you don't have to uh, basically embed your passwords in a script. Um, you could do something like that here. This is just asking for user input from the console. Uh, but basically, all we're doing we're instantiating an NS file handler for standard input. And then this line right here, it um, instantiates an NS string with the data from that standard input and encodes it as a UTF-8 string. So is the script basically going to stop uh, on line 19 until you hit enter? Yes, absolutely. Okay. It, it <coughs> absolutely stops. It will, it will not keep going. Um, cool. So that lets you do some true interactivity. And you could see, you know, if you wanted to handle more flags or if you wanted to do more stuff, then you can do stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Other things you can do, um, you can actually make direct calls to bash commands, um, regular terminal commands like the cat command or ls, or you can move directories. Um, although for a lot of that stuff, it's recommended that you use NS File Manager uh, because you have full access to that because it's in Foundation. That's a much preferable way, but if you already have existing command line applications that you built uh, or you downloaded the third party script um, that does something interesting, uh, or maybe you're trying to automate something like, I don't know, initializing a Git repository, um, you can make a call into that using the foundation class NS task, and you can even pipe it together with other um, scripts and stuff using NS pipe. Um, it's actually interesting to note. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, 
you get piping for free. Um, and I'll show you that with a log application that I built uh, that lets me track my daily logs. So on top of the, um, being able to use um, shell commands, you can also use AppleScript. Um, and I only did an AppleScript example, but you can also use um, the new JavaScript core framework. Um, so you can use JavaScript for automation. You can call it straight from here. Um, pretty interesting. One idea I've seen is using JavaScript, JavaScript to create plugins. Um, I know that's how uh, applications like um, what is that automation text editor iPhone app called? I forget what it's called. It's the one that has all the no. It like ties into all these other applications. Yes, yeah, drafts. Drafts let you d lets third parties develop basically app plugins, and from what I understand, it's basically just JavaScript um, because you are allowed to execute JavaScript within um, dynamically within a, an application using the JavaScript core stuff. Um, you, plus, you could also use it uh, if you were using JavaScript to automate stuff on the Mac if you have gotten into that at all since they announced it. Um, I guess technically you could also use it um, if you wanted to use script as part of some type of uh, Mac-based web server and you wanted to manipulate the JavaScript at all, um, which you could also manipulate the HTML if you wanted to build a, a script, a Swift-based uh, HTML renderer or something like that. Uh, so this is my Apple script um, example. Uh, what I've done at the top is I have defined in an enum uh, just a couple of commands um, and what these do is obviously they shut down, restart, sleep, and lock my computer. Um, and I'm actually going to disable this because I don't want to accidentally call this because we've already had enough computer issues today. Um, but you can see here basically what it looks like to call um, uh, Apple Script is you instantiate an instance of um, NS Apple Script class and as you can see right here you can actually instantiate it directly from a source file and it's just a string uh, you have to properly escape um, quotation marks um, but that's all it is just a, a string that contains basically the source code for whatever Apple script you want to do um, you could also do uh, use NS file manager and pull in an existing Apple script file um, grab the file contents and use that to instantiate from source I think NS Apple Script also has um, a uh, an initializer that lets you initiate straight from a file. So if you have the path to that file, you can initiate straight from it. So basically, all I'm doing is I'm switching across, uh, switching on the the user input, um, and whenever I hit the right one, I assign the script to perform with the appropriate source code. Once we break out of the script, if this script has anything in it, because we defined it as an optional up here at the top. You guys have used optionals at all in Swift, and then they're kind of disconcerting at times. Um, so we just do basically optional binding here to check that there is actually something there, and then we define an error dictionary, which kind of threw me off. I was expecting just a regular error object, um, and then we perform the script. Um, you can see here that I commented out the execution because I don't actually want to shut down my computer. Um, but without further ado. So hey, for the six. Go ahead. Did you guys use single quotation marks to not escape the double? Um, is that, is that, that's how it works in JavaScript. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about AppleScript, which is where the the quotes are coming from. Um, I think you can. Like if you you do the whole thing with single. I know in Swift you cannot. In Swift you have to use double quotes to, to define a string. Yes. Um, but with, within within Java within AppleScript, I don't know if, if these interior, I don't know if they have to be single quotes or not. Well, in JavaScript, you could do the control outside singly, and then anything inside can be covered. Yeah, I, Swift is a little bit more. Um, it errs on the side of caution. So if it get, if you if you would think it's possible in JavaScript, it's probably not possible in Swift. Um, that looks a lot like it does, but there, I, I promise that it, you'll, like, you'll be in a world of hurt okay. if you try to use JavaScript to program this. Raw Apple events. You, you can call raw Apple uh, events as well. Uh, 
Um, there's actually there's there's actually an NS Apple script um, initializer, or actually there's an NS Apple events class um, that you could call. Uh, this is just a script I found on the internet. Uh, I actually built a couple of utility apps. Um, you guys are familiar with um, Alfred or Quicksilver? I was trying to natively replace uh, Alfred with just Spotlight because I was on Yosemite and I like the new the new Spotlight, all the functionality. So I built these little binary applications that made calls into Apple Script, uh, Apple Apple Script to you know shut down and lock and do things like that. Anybody have any questions about the the piping multiple different types of scripts together in the same application? I assume you could do the same thing with Python or Ruby or some other kind of application if you knew how to handle it. You could probably use the NS task to perform a Ruby script, uh, or you could use Splunk or whatever else you wanted to do. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so I told you it could probably be applicable to your job. Um, See if I can write an alert script. So it's oh yeah, and, and that's the cool thing is like say you want to make a UI alert view to pop up and tell you something, you have that full access to that all the Mac um, foundation APIs and stuff like that. So you can make you can post notifications, you can pop up alert okay. views. Um, so do you have a what's the facility for reading an incoming pipe? How do you? Um, I did not make an example for that. Um, however, you just have a standard in. Uh, I assume what you would do is you would initiate the script from the one that you wanted to pipe into the Swift, and then you would pipe it, uh, so something like, uh, so we'll call this my initial script, uh, and then you would just pipe it into your next one, because it just goes through standard in. Okay, but I meant more like what is the Swift, how do you? Oh, um, that's why that, that, that was the example I showed yeah. earlier. The, the dynamic. Yeah, there were a couple of different classes uh, inside of that. The NS file handle. Yeah, all the NS file handle. And then NS task and NS pipe. Uh, I didn't go too deep into that API, um, but there were a lot of options um, for piping together stuff. Yeah, okay. So you can, you can create a... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right here is... Uh, just the the user input, but do you have something to add? Sorry. No, I was saying if I I would probably use the less than less than sign maybe to redirect the yeah 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 you can you can do that type of stuff. The script. Yeah, you could absolutely do that. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, I don't know why you'd ever want to do this, but maybe you do. So since you can like call other you know scripts from within here, mm -hmm. like system commands. Say one of those has dynamic input. Do you I I did not go down that rabbit hole. I assume it would work. Um, um, I think I'm guessing there's a standard out that you write to. Yeah, in yeah. A similar. There, way. there. You. It's a, yeah. a a method in NS file handle, and then NS pipe would let you also pipe stuff in to other. There's a there's a couple different just like anything with Cocoa. There's a couple yeah. different ways to do anything. Okay. Um, so yeah, there. I encourage you guys to explore those APIs uh, after tonight. <laughs> okay. um, and just so you know, I'm actually um, going to be uh, creating a Swift scripts repository that's going to have a lot of the source code in it. Um, and I'm actually working on a wiki that has a lot of this information that I'm going to talk to since I didn't have any slides. Um, so if you guys want to make pull requests or make suggestions or anything like that, feel free. I'm going to try to keep this information as updated as possible. Because I have never been one for bash scripting, but I have really enjoyed Swift scripting. Um, any more questions on on this before we go forward? I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I do a lot sure. of script stuff, type and all that. I've been wanting to learn Swift, and I have a really good excuse. <laughs> so this is my, my favorite example so far. Uh, has anybody done any Swift development? Yeah, have you gotten the uh, source kit termination error code yet? Uh, like every source kit blows up all day. Yeah. Although apparently, like all right, well, I can't, not, I can't tell you how to not. I can't. I can't tell you how to not get it, uh, but I can give you this script which kills your derived data folder. Um, so I could use that script for a whole ton of other. Reasons. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you can reuse this for any kind of file manipulation. Uh, basically, what we do is we use the NS directory for user uh, class to grab our, our Xcode derived data folder, uh, and instantiate a file manager, 
Uh, if that file exists, uh, we are going to remove that file and do some error handling. And just to show you guys this, because I really, oops, sorry. Go ahead and run that. Swift is happy again. And you can see that our derived data folder is nuked. Now all you'd have to do is clean and build your product and hopefully all your Swift errors will go away temporarily. They, they will come back. back, but that's why you would make <laughs> that's why you make an alias. Um, I don't know if you guys saw my bash script, my bash you made an alias to it and you just call it. Um, make Swift happy. I'm sure you could actually also build an Apple script to run the build and clean for you. Um, I did not go that far down the path though. Um, run that script is uh, run script as the last build phase. So you build everything. Absolutely. Blast Absolutely. That, and that, that's, that's where that's exciting. where this really comes in and really shines is you can start doing things with Xcode that if you were not someone who did bash scripts would never do. So you can add things to your build phases and you can call those directly from a Swift script um, and you wouldn't have to learn an, another language if you're already learning Swift, which so is the really cool thing about can it. Can you uh, have a build phase with a Swift script that you just replace the slash bin slash sh that you know by default it provides with the uh, well I guess no that won't really work. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do so. slash user bin dmv xc run swift? I wonder. Yeah, I mean this you can I as a build phase script. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So this the it's the yeah, that text well, field is, is, yeah. is interpreting that as a command line. Yeah, 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 yeah. so, so, you, there, so that's you would, whatever you would comes never, after the shebang in the regular script. Yeah, so when you're calling a, a script, like when you're assigning it in a build phase, all you have to do is type basically type in the path to the file, and then when it runs and tries to interpret it, as long as you made it executable with chmod, then it interprets the, the shebang as soon as it enters it, and then starts up the Swift environment. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do anything crazy. You just basically make a call directly to the file. And everything else is automatic. Um, so I did bring this up. Um, there is this um, third-party uh, repository called Option Kit. Uh, I'm going to show you mine that I built, um, but wanted to show you this one too because this is kind of what brought um, inspired me. Um, so basically, you would define all your options within the script. Um, and then you pass it in the process arguments. They do this really nifty thing where they pass it in um, using the Swift range operator. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, and then they actually they do the parse right here, and then they get the result, and then they handle the result based on what they wanted to do with it. Um, so this was you would do this instead of um, I don't know like a bunch of if else chains or a switch statement or something like that, uh, or defining your own enum. I did not really like this one because I feel like it would be much easier just to define your own enum. Um, so what I did is I built uh, I built an option uh, parsing library. I'm already in Xcode. And it basically lets you has three classes. There are options, which are a Swift structure. Um, it has a couple of functionality. So you have a long flag, a short flag, completion handler that you can define, which takes a result object, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, and then there is a an initializer here, a structure memberize initializer, um, and then there is a checker function that you can use to check if an option matches one that you've defined. Um, then there's the so that's the front end of it, and the back end is the result, which is just it contains an option, so you can use it if you wanted to do some further. Um, so you'll know what arguments were read in after it, and then you have the arguments array, which is an array of everything that came after your flag that you defined. Um, and then I have a parser, uh, which then I just pass it in, and it handles um, processing, which basically packages it all up. And if you uh, provided a completion handler, it calls the completion handler for you. Um, that'll be posted on my GitHub account as well. So if you want to go into the specifics of that, I won't cover that tonight. Uh, 
I'm just uh, Blake Merriman. So, this is my daily log application. Um, so, basically, what I do is I just keep track of things throughout the day, um, write down ideas and tasks that I have to accomplish. Um, and then I just type my log. And I have short commands, but just for the sake of this, I'll go ahead and append this to the end of my log. And so I get a confirmation message, and I can also list it out. And you can see um, the contents of the log here. Um, I use Markdown for my, my log formats. You could do just plain text or whatever you wanted to. Um, so basically what this does is it pulls in my CL parse uh, framework that I just showed you guys. And again, it uses that uh, option that it passes to the Swift environment to search the library framework. So any, any custom or third-party framework that you drop into the, this, this location or any custom-defined location that you pass in up here, um, it'll be available to your Swift script. And the cool thing is, is if you have one script that searches this directory, but you have another script that searches a different directory, that doesn't really matter. And that's one of the cool things about using the shebang at the beginning of the file. It allows you to do a lot of cool stuff. Um, so you, if you guys want to use this uh, application, it'll also be posted. Um, and you can edit the personal preferences here at the top, so it'll you know, open up in your preferred text editor if you use the open command. or And you can put your author name um, and where you want to store it. There's also a help file that you can relocate somewhere. So I'm going to go ahead and collapse most of these just so we can browse through it. Um, basically all this does, um, it builds a file, it builds a header to put in the file, it makes sure that the directory where I'm storing it is good and it creates the file there. And this is all the information that it uses to build up that file. So we get a today's date using the NSDate um, designated initializer. Um, we go ahead and build the file. We build the log, and then we pull the file manager, check the directory, create the file, um, and then we add the header to the file. So that's the, at the beginning here, that's this part at the top. I know it's kind of small, but this right here is the, the header that I use at the top of all the logs. I know this is kind of a convoluted example, but I just wanted to show you a, like a real working script that I built. Um, I didn't, didn't want to have a bunch of trivial examples, like Hello World. Um, so this is the meat of it where we get into the, the custom framework that I defined. So this is an option. Um, so you define your long flag, your short flag. I need to update it so that it knows whether it accepts arguments or anything like that. Um, and then we define the completion handler using the nice trailing uh, closure syntax. Um, and then, so basically all I've done here is if there's a help command passed in. We display the help file using the ns task um, and we call the cat command. Um, this file is a little bit different. This one is a little bit different. So if we call this, so we do my log dot open and it actually opens up your log file in your preferred text editor. Um, so you can see that this would potentially allow you to do some dynamic stuff with your script. So if you wanted to have a script that set up your workspace for the day or set up your workspace for a particular project. Um, I'm just using NS Workspace, Shared Workspace. Um, and you, one thing to note, you do have to import, I think, is AppKit to use this. Um, but that's one of the cool things is you can import any frameworks as long as you have the correct search paths. Um, this one is a default one, so all you have to do is you don't have to add a search path for that. Um, this is another uh, NS task completion handler. Um, just list out the log. Um, and this is the one that appends it. So it uses um, NS file manager and NS strings to append any uh, text that you pass in to the end of the log. Um, and as I was telling you guys, everything has to execute at top level. So everything I've defined so far, uh, with the exception of setting up the file, has not currently been executed. Um, so at the end of the file, once you've defined all your options, this is really the meat of the program. Um, and that's basically all there is to it. You just pass the options that you've defined in and call the parser and it's good to go.
So just a couple of pros and cons, things that I found while I was developing script uh, scripts, uh, and then we'll be done. Uh, we can go to Q&A or anything like that. Um, it's pretty quick and simple. You don't even have to use Xcode if you don't want to. I did most of my scripting in Sublime Text. Um, uh, no compiling needed, um, not manual anyways. As I was telling you earlier, when you use the shebang, it actually passes your file into the Swift environment, compiles it, and then runs it. Um, and then if you, you ever write a script and try to run it and it's not perfectly kosher, um, the terminal will blow up and give you a pretty nice error dialog. Actually, I can demonstrate, demonstrate that. Um, so if we'll do, I think it was six. Yeah. Um, so if we pass in something that's not defined as an option, so I'll go ahead and pass this in so you can see it. Um, if I had that, uh, I have it commented out so it won't execute, and I just do a, like a basic print statement just to show that it completed successfully. Um, but if we pass something in that is not defined, so, um, you know, gobbledygook, um, Swift does not like that. Um, if you don't do correct error handling and take care of stuff, um, it'll give you a nice little stack trace here, um, and a lot of times it'll actually give you a, uh, a color-coded message that tells you where in your syntax you're wrong. Um, so just to demonstrate that, i actually close that. Um, you were handling that in the switch statement? Uh, yeah, the yeah, options. yeah. Do you the, have a default case? Um, that's the cool thing about Swift. As long as, so for instance, if you, in that option that I had, Apple script example, uh, let's get out of that because that's not big enough. So one of the cool things about Swift is if you have an enum and all of your options are defined, when you go through a switch statement, as long as you make a case for each one, there is no default case. So it eliminates. Um, a little right. bit of typing. Okay, yeah. So there's no default cases and you don't have to use break statements. Implicit fall through is gone. Um, you actually have to specify if you want it to fall through. Um, so you can see here that I account for all four cases. Uh, and if, for instance, if we take this out, uh, some weird optional stuff, sometimes you have to force unwrap it. Um, but if we go ahead and run this script again, and we'll run it correctly this time, um, you can see that Swift gives us an error and says, hey, you know, this is not the correct thing. You have something wrong with either your option case, and it tells us that it's an optional, so it doesn't match. Um, and then you'll know that it has something to do with the fact that you're dealing with optionals incorrectly. Um, so those are the pros. It's quick, no Xcode, uh, no compiling, um, and when you mess up, X, uh, the terminal lets you know pretty quick. Um, the cons, though, because you are invoking the Swift environment and then having your file passed in, compiled, and then run, it's a little bit slower, so it does kind of perform almost like a scripting language. Um, it's not documented well at all. Um, I've been working on this for you know, probably the past month, um, and most of the work that I've been able to accomplish has been within the past uh, two weeks or so, just because you have to track all this stuff down. There's a couple of websites that have some examples, but most of them are back uh, from when Swift first came out, so it's still using a lot of the older sample code and stuff like that. And Apple has not been very forthcoming. I think the only thing that signified that Swift could be used as a scripting language was one tweet by Chris Latner, uh, which is the guy who invented Swift. Um, and there's really been nothing else from Apple about officially supporting this. Um, just vague mentions here and there. Um, as I showed, and hopefully as you noticed, handling user input can be tedious. That's why I developed the CL parse library and why option kit library also exists. Um, I think uh, the bash shell, um, and I think this, there was a C-based API that Coco had um, that lets you handle user input a little bit easier. None of that stuff's available in Swift, really. Um, so you either have to roll your own with enums, switch statements, and if-else chains, or use something like uh, the CL parse library that I built up or um, the option kit. One downside of not using Xcode, uh, code completion is no longer there. Even with the best third-party uh, plugins that I could find for Sublime Text, there's no way to get code completion for like all the foundation classes and stuff like that. 
So it's a lot of keeping your documentation open or building it all in a playground so that you get autocomplete and also some pretty cool dynamic R&D capabilities. Uh, and then copy and paste it over to a, swip, uh, a script. I guess you could write a script that grabs your code from a playground and exports it into a Swift, a Swift script with the proper shebang and all that. Um, I haven't attempted that yet, though. Um, also, no compiler warnings. So if you mess up, you have to wait until you run it. Uh, if you're not doing it in a playground or in Xcode, you have to wait until you run it to get the error message from the Swift environment. Um, and then I think most of us here are iOS dev developers, right? Um, one thing I did notice is it does take a little bit of a different way of thinking about programming, um, just because most of what we do is object-oriented and it's event-driven, whereas this is mostly procedural. Um, so it's not a bad thing or a good thing, really. It's just you do have to think about it a little bit differently when you're programming uh, scripts. So uh, if anybody has any questions, that's all I have for tonight. What's the most useful thing? That you've developed with scripting and Swift? Um, the two big scripts that I showed you, the derived data killer uh, and um, the log. I've been using the log pretty much every day for the past month since I started this. Um, and it is, uh, it's kind of what brought about the need for the CL parse library uh, is because I started adding options and then it just became like a, ma a nasty if else chains and then you have bunches of if lets and it's nice to be able to abstract the generalized case of what you do when you get an option, and then just define each option and let it go. Uh, so the CL parse library, the logging script, and the derived data folder, the ones that I really am most proud of. Everything else has been pretty trivial. Mostly were the examples I showed you guys tonight, just to prove that something was possible. Um, so one question I had is, um, so if you, or I guess, can you do anything asynchronously in your script? Um, I, I did not attempt this. Um, I assume if you use uh, Grand, Central Dis Grand Central Dispatch, um, it'll let you. Because um, I'm guessing, like, do you return like a one or a zero at like, the end of your script? No, no, no. It's none of these like scripts that. have any kind of returns. It's okay. like implicitly returned, I okay. guess. Um, so I was going to say, if you were doing something asynchronously, it might like. <clears throat> immediately complete and then not have anything. Yeah, I, I would not recommend doing asynchronous coding for anything that is super critical uh, for scripts, in particular for scripts, but um, definitely worth looking into, for sure. Yeah. So if you were doing some kind of networking, um, I don't know, would you, I don't know, use curl or yeah, you could you could you could call curl uh, through NS task, um, but I think uh, Coco Foundation um, it has a lot of networking APIs. I mean, you could use uh, AF networking or Alamo Fire if you wanted to, uh, which would probably be the better option for something like Swift. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alamo Fire is pretty sweet for Swift. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to play with it, but it looks really nice. For something simple, I guess you could do the uh, NS data contents with URL. Yeah, so it's yeah. like a remote URL. It'll just wait for it to complete. Yeah, so finally, yeah, finally one day. Absolutely, yeah. I yeah. used that yesterday. Actually, <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, I'm sure most of you know you learn the basic concepts and you chain it all together into something complex and you know terribly unwieldy, but you know, it's useful for something. Um, same thing here with Swift scripts. I mean, you could you could build an application that uses Apple Script to tie into a GUI application then uses JavaScript to pull something off the web and mishmash that together into something, you know? <laughs> it's pretty limitless, just like, you know, you're making an iOS app or a Mac app, the only difference is you're only putting in one file or you're using third-party frameworks uh, to offload some of that code from you. Um, overall, I think it's really fun, and like I said earlier, I really have enjoyed being able to script without having to learn something like Bash or, you know, another language like Python. I was already going to learn Swift, so I thought, hey, if I can use it for scripting, pretty cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, man.